Sure, I get angry. Uh, I get very, very angry and indignant. Uh, I don't like being locked up for something I didn't do, and I don't like my liberty taken away, and I don't like being treated like an animal, and I don't like, like people walking around and ogling me like I'm some sort of weirdo, because I'm not. On January 24th, 1989, at 7 a.m., before the sun rose over the state prison in Stark, Florida, plans were underway in the death house for an execution many thought would never occur. The electrocution of Ted Bundy, America's most notorious serial killer. After nearly 10 years on death row, Bundy was scheduled to die for the 1978 murder of Kimberly Leach, a 12-year-old girl. Yet he admitted to killing more than 30 others in a grisly bloodbath that took him through Washington State, Oregon, Utah, Idaho, and Colorado. Since his original capture in 1976, Bundy had become a media sensation. I'll plead not guilty right now. And your America was mesmerized by the former Boy Scout, college graduate, and law student who, as a rising young Republican, was even a shining star in Washington state politics. The Ted Bundy we knew, before there were any accusations, any charges, any arrests, or anything, uh, was a very nice guy. He was a friend of ours. We didn't think he was strange or different. Once he was arrested, Bundy taunted the system. He escaped twice from Colorado prisons while awaiting murder trials there. After his arrest in Florida, he showboated, acting as his own counsel while rapt groupies devoured his every move. He was like a movie star, and if he'd look around, they'd all giggle and nudge each other. And I thought, it never occurs to them that if he were free and he met them on a dark night, they're just the type of potential victim he would be looking for. But Bundy's natural cockiness was now gone as two guards led him to the death chamber. Bundy seemed very resigned to his fate. Bundy seemed startled when he saw the electric chair. Outside the jail, a crowd estimated at 500 avidly awaiting news of his demise chanted slogans like, Burn, Bundy, burn. They ran electricity through his At 7.16 a.m., an anonymous executioner pushed the button. 2,000 volts surged through Bundy's body. Within 60 seconds, one of the worst serial killers of all time was pronounced dead. When we came out after the, the execution, it's almost a carnival atmosphere on the part of some of these people. Cheering, uh, blowing of horns, uh, celebration. He'd had an easier death than any of his victims. Some 35 women may have fallen prey to him. Only he knew the real number, and he carried that with him to his grave. Police believe Bundy's killing spree had begun in 1974, when he was 28 years old, studying law and living adjacent to the University of Washington in Seattle. He made a very, very positive impression. Uh, he was, uh, he was very verbal, articulate, intelligent. I guess if I were to characterize him, he looked like a young Cary Grant. But at that time, no one could guess that this clean-cut and good-looking young man was about to begin a series of rapes, tortures, murders, and dismemberments that would shock the world. After midnight on January 4th, 1974, Ted Bundy stood outside the basement bedroom window of Joni Lenz, an 18-year-old student at the University of Washington. He entered her bedroom through a door accessible from outside, and while she slept, he savagely bludgeoned her with a crowbar. The next morning, Joni was found surrounded by a pool of blood. A bed rod had been torn away from her headboard, and in a sexual frenzy, rammed into her vagina. There was a specific reason why Bundy singled out Joni. It was a physical characteristic she shared with almost all of his victims. She wore her hair long 
and parted in the middle. But it would take years before the police understood why that moved Bundy to murder. Linda Ann Healy was a senior at the University of Washington, majoring in psychology. On January 31st, 1974, after Linda had gone to bed, Bundy broke into her room. He knocked her unconscious, wrapped her in bed sheets, and quietly carried Linda out of the house. Her scattered body parts and decapitated skull wouldn't be found for a year. To those who would track him, and those who would later try to understand his crimes, the question remained, how could this charming and intelligent young man commit such unspeakable crimes against people he didn't even know? They are things. They are victims. They are not women. And I never heard him really use the term women or females or anything very often. He referred to them as things, as objects. The other person's life doesn't have value since he doesn't see her as a real person with real needs. And if anything, the idea that investigators and the community will be shocked and the parents will suffer just makes it all the more exciting because he's getting even. Yet somehow Bundy, like other serial killers, was able to keep the murderous rage hidden inside of him secret. To his friends, family, and colleagues, he seemed very well adjusted. Nice person. And he was a person that we socialized with and uh, we knew a little bit professionally and I thought was really an up and comer. Somebody was gonna do well in life. One of the very important aspects of the facade that he built was one of great sincerity. He literally oozed sincerity. Yet appearances can deceive and Ted Bundy was a master of deception. Little did I realize, of course, at the time that that was a carefully crafted social veneer that he had laboriously developed and used in, in his interactions. I never saw any aspects of the monster that lurked behind that mask. But by 1974, the monster who lived behind the mask had been there for a long time, perhaps since Ted's earliest childhood. I have always felt that uh, beneath the veneer of a, a normal childhood was, was some great hostility toward someone, probably his mother. Police believe that in 1974, Ted Bundy embarked upon a series of grisly murders that began in Seattle, Washington, and over a period of five years, spread through Oregon, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, and Florida. His rampage took the lives of at least 35 young women. When he was arrested in 1976, one of those most steadfast in his defense was his mother, Louise Bundy. She would continue believing in her son until his execution in 1989. My Christian upbringing tells me that to take another's life under any circumstances is wrong. And I don't believe the state of Florida is above uh, the laws of God. Louise is a, a petite woman, a very nice woman. She was in denial until the night before Ted was executed when he told her the truth. Many experts believe the seeds of Bundy's rage were planted in his childhood. He was born Theodore Robert Cowell on November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont. His mother, whose maiden name was Eleanor Louise Cowell, was a prim, modest department store clerk who had come to Vermont from her home in Philadelphia to give birth to her child, a child born out of wedlock. Ted was born illegitimate. He was born in a home for unwed mothers. His mother, I think, was about 23 then. Soon after his birth, Eleanor took Ted back to Philadelphia. It was the beginning of a tragic charade. As he grew, Ted was told that his grandparents were his mother and father, and that Eleanor was his older sister. From an early age, Ted sensed he was living a lie. And there were other problems at home. Eleanor's mother had a history of clinical depression, suffered panic attacks, and was eventually treated with electroshock therapy. 
Her father, Samuel Cowell, was known to be an extremely violent and frightening individual. Sam Cowell was evidently a man with a maniacal temper who read pornography, who tossed his daughters down the stairs if they slept too late. As he grew into a young man, the confusion over his relationship with his mother would weigh on Ted. Even at the age of three, there were signs that he was not a well-adjusted child. His teenage aunt was taking a nap, and she woke up to see that he had taken all the knives out of the kitchen drawer and arranged them around her body with the blades pointing toward her. His mother, concerned with this behavior and trying to escape the control of her father, moved with Ted to live near her uncle Jack Cowell and his family in Tacoma, Washington. In later years, Ted said that it was devastating for him to leave Sam, the man he thought of as his father. In Tacoma, Eleanor went by her middle name Louise and worked as a secretary at the Council of Churches. One evening, she met a hospital cook named John Culpepper Bundy. Louise married him a year later, and her son finally had the name he would carry through life, Theodore Robert Bundy. But Ted was never close to John. He had a lot of conflict with his stepfather, uh, looked down upon his stepfather because his stepfather didn't have a high enough station in life. Despite his new name, Ted still considered himself a Cowell and was drawn to his great uncle Jack, a cultured music professor at the University of Puget Sound in Washington. Ted wanted to be just like him. It was very important for him to be someone special, to be recognized in some way. Over the next 10 years, John and Louise added two brothers and two sisters to the Bundy family. But Ted had little to do with them or their father. He had a Boy Scout troop, but Ted would never go camping. He just seemed to remove himself from any connection to his stepfather. And if there was no connection at home, there was even less at school. His junior and high school friends described Ted as very shy. He suffered from stuttering, and he did not date at all. He really didn't date unless it was a Sadie Hawkins dance where the girls asked him. But there was a secret side to Ted Bundy that was already emerging. He considered himself above the law. By the time he was 15, he had become an expert shoplifter and was a suspect in two burglaries. Grandiose narcissism, the ability to outwit the police, the ability to you know, flaunt authority, the, the ability to shoplift. All of these things uh, helped confer on him this sort of narcissistic uh, sense of specialness and entitlement. His relationship with women also changed for the worse. He became a peeping Tom, sneaking through the night to peer into the windows of young girls. More significantly, there have always been suspicions that at the age of 15, Ted Bundy became a killer. Ted carried the morning newspaper when he was 15. Along his route, there was a young girl named Anne Marie Burr. Anne Marie was eight. Ted knew Anne Marie. She took piano lessons from his great uncle Jack. On August 31st, 1961, Anne Marie's parents found her missing from her bedroom. The window was open a little bit, and it was in the days when you had a TV cable on the roof and you had to get it under the window so they couldn't lock it. The front door was ajar. She was gone. A search that at one time involved 800 soldiers, lawmen, and volunteers found nothing. At the time, no one suspected that Ted may have been responsible for Anne Marie's death. In my mind, she was Ted's first victim. And there would be many more. In the mid-1960s, Ted Bundy was a student at Woodrow Wilson High School in Tacoma, Washington. Even though he was smart, good-looking, and friendly, he was awkward with his fellow students, especially the girls. 
there seemed to be a real defect in this whole notion of how do you build a close, intimate relationship and some confusion about that. The arena in which he seemed to feel secure was the school, the classroom where he could use his verbal skills, and that's where he tried to manage teachers' impressions. He graduated from high school in 1965 with a B average. The next year, he entered the University of Puget Sound, but on the huge campus, he felt anonymous and lost. Inside, Ted was very empty and very inadequate, but he, he could put on the facade of a very sophisticated, educated young man. In 1967, as part of the facade, Ted transferred to the University of Washington's Asian Studies program, where he studied Chinese. He also began fabricating a new personality. If the old Ted was shy and withdrawn, the new Ted would be witty, cool, and self-assured. His deception was about to pay off. At the university, Ted met Stephanie Brooks. He was particularly attracted to her beautiful shoulder-length hair, which she wore parted in the middle. She was wealthy, sophisticated, and worldly. Everything Ted wished he was. He said, she's perfect, she's beautiful, she's wealthy. And I think, to the degree he was capable, he was in love with her. They stayed together for a year. For the first time, Ted experienced an intimate sexual relationship with a woman. He was in love with her. But to Stephanie, they were merely college sweethearts. She saw no future in the relationship. She thought Ted was immature. Ted had become obsessed with her, but Stephanie told Ted their romance was over. She told him that he wasn't going anywhere, that uh, he had no ambition, he wasn't organized, he couldn't um, make plans. Ted was devastated. With his world unraveling, he dropped out of school and decided to visit his relatives back in Philadelphia. His visit had a purpose. He had to answer the question that had always bothered him. Who was he? After checking records in Philadelphia, he traveled to Burlington, Vermont. There in City Hall, he learned something he had always suspected. He discovered that his mother was actually the woman who'd been passing as his sister his whole life. And that has got to rock the world of anybody to find that their roots are not what they thought. There was a great deal of turmoil around his own self-identity and who he was. By all accounts, when he found out that he was an illegitimate child, it was devastating. This man was badly betrayed by a woman, his mother, and learned of that betrayal at the very period when he's still reeling from the rejection by his girlfriend, his first love. Many who have studied Ted Bundy feel it was now that he decided to take revenge on the women he felt had destroyed his life. With an icy resolve, he returned to the University of Washington, took a room nearby, and began studying psychology. He excelled in all his classes and seemed rejuvenated with a new purpose. And whatever demons raged inside of him, Ted Bundy kept them well hidden. Many people like him have an ability to create compartments in their lives. And this entity, this demon, this depraved monster lived in one of those compartments. As far as anyone knew, Ted's life seemed to be changing for the better. In 1969, he met Elizabeth Kendall, a young divorcee. They began a friendship and then a romance. Very smart, shy young woman. Uh, she came up here from Utah. They met in a, in a tavern. She loved him. She loved him unabashedly. His relationship with Elizabeth seemed to work wonders for him. But underneath, he was seething and plotting revenge. If you really have a very negative core in yourself, there's this kind of envy, a need to destroy the beauty in others. And the first one on his list 
was Stephanie Brooks. He was secretly still talking to Stephanie, hoping to make her fall in love with him again in order to hurt her just as she had scarred him. To enhance his image, he became active in local politics, working on the governor's re-election campaign. I thought he was very smart, good at politics. He was good at what he did. He, he was friendly. In 1971, at the age of 25, Bundy was working in his spare time at the Seattle Crisis Center, manning the suicide hotline phones. Beside him worked soon-to-be author Ann Rule. He was kind, he was uh, very good on the phone, and ironically, we saved lives together. Now, at that point, if anybody had told me that there was anything underneath this perfect surface, I would have said, you're crazy. Because we were locked up all alone together in a four-story Victorian mansion that looked like nothing so much as the house in Psycho. Um, but I felt safe locked inside with Ted Bundy. By 1972, Ted's first real girlfriend, Stephanie, still inhabited his thoughts and his plans. On a business trip to San Francisco, he met with her, and the new Ted Bundy swept her off her feet. And she fell madly in love with him and agreed to marry him. As soon as she agreed to marry him, he dumped her. Two days later, on January 4th, 1974, Ted Bundy began a five-year rampage of killing that would horrify the nation. Most of his 35 victims had one thing in common. His ideal victim was a small frame female, long hair, water in the middle, style of person, usually pretty good looking. They all resembled Stephanie Brooks. On January 4, 1974, just days after severing his relationship with Stephanie Brooks, Ted Bundy began his reign of terror. Over the next six months, eight women disappeared from college campuses in Washington, Oregon, and Utah. I think he was looking for victims 24 hours a day. There were people that he specifically was scoping out acting like a predator towards and then there were those that were just happened to be at a, the right place at the right time for him his first two victims were students at the university of washington people like to believe that it was someone from outside there must be some depraved killer out there in the community who is coming to the campus little did we know that the killer was one of us even his girlfriend, Elizabeth Kendall, had no idea who Ted really was. From February through June 1st, Carol Valenzuela, Nancy Wilcox, Donna Manson, Susan Rancourt, Brenda Ball, and Roberta Parks all vanished. Nobody had connected any of these cases together different police jurisdictions, different states. This was a terrible mystery. I mean, who, how could these girls suddenly just disappear? One little girl was walking like 30 feet from the back of her sorority to another sorority, and boom, she's gone. How could this happen? Her name was George Ann Hawkins. Years later, after his capture, Bundy divulged the perverse methods he used to stalk and capture so many of his victims he preyed upon their kindness by pretending to be injured. The girls he picked were all helping kinds of people. Here's this guy on crutches often, limping along, dropping his books, and he would ask young women, well, could you help me get these, these to my car? That was the ruse he used on George Ann Hawkins. As she bent over to put his books into his car, Bundy grabbed a tire iron he had hidden. He hit her over the head and pushed her into the car. He would secure their hands in some fashion, either with handcuffs, strips of sheet, or leather. His seat was missing, so they could lay down in there and no one would ever see him. Bundy usually drove his victims into the deep woods surrounding Seattle. If they survived his attack with the crowbar, he would sexually assault them. From his point of view, 
the thing that would make for good sex is an attractive woman whom he's going to handcuff, terrorize, and make her believe that she's going to die. Later on death row, he was asked what it was like to murder someone. And he answered, murder is not about lust and it's not about violence, it's about possession. When you feel the last breath of life coming out of the woman, you look into her eyes, at that point, it's being God. After he was through, he would discard them deep in the forest, but he would return later. He was going back over and over and over again to crime scenes, not to just destroy evidence or anything, but to do things with those bodies. We suspected he took a whole body home with him because we had one victim that was totally made up with stuff that she never wore. Bundy's use of makeup is simply to make a victim more attractive, but apparently he didn't require it. He went back to decomposed corpses and still had sex with them. To the psychiatric experts who studied him, Bundy was unique, straddling two different categories of serial killers. He is both a sexually sadistic serial killer, he's also a necrophilic serial killer. The common characteristics are perversion, lack of conscience, and a willingness to sacrifice others' lives for one's own sexual pleasure. There's not a lot more to it than that. After at least eight murders, Ted Bundy was becoming an expert at killing. In July of 1974, his addiction led him to take two women in one day. A beautiful Sunday afternoon. It was 90 degrees in Seattle, and we don't get that many 90-degree days. Everybody was at Lake Sammamish State Park. One of those was Janice Ott. She was lying on the beach when Ted approached her. He had his arm in a sling. He asked if she could help him tie his boat to his car. When she got up to go with him, she stuck out her hand like she was going to shake hands, and she said, hi, I'm Jan, and he said, oh, I'm Ted. Janice walked away with Ted and was never seen alive again. An hour later, Ted was back at the park. There were at least four to five other women who were approached between, say, 1 o'clock in the afternoon and 4.30. But something about Bundy must have put them off. Denise Nasland wasn't as lucky. At about 5 p.m., she walked to the restroom at the lake. She was there with her boyfriend, her dog, another couple. She left with the dog to go to the bathroom. The dog came back, but she didn't. After the disappearance of Ott and Nasland, witnesses who had met with the mysterious Ted at Lake Sammamish that afternoon came forward. A composite sketch of the man was circulated. The police received 3,500 tips and compiled a list of potential suspects named Ted. Bundy's name was among them. The name Ted was brought up. I never made the connect at all. You only met the monster through his acts. Between 1973 and 1974, the monster had been working for the King County Law and Justice Planning Office, where he was preparing a study on rapists and their victims. He was also secretly studying the procedures the police were using to try and catch him. By October 1974, five more bodies had been found, but most of them had decomposed or were just scattered bones. Bundy had left no clues, and he was long gone. Two months earlier, he had been accepted to the Utah University School of Law, but he could not stop himself from killing. The Ted Bundy that we knew was not a murderer, but maybe an hour later, he was. That's the awful part. Though his outward mask still projected charm and sincerity, the killer underneath it was about to be revealed. Bundy would soon be identified when one of his victims escaped. By early November 1974, 
Ted Bundy had murdered at least 11 women in Washington and Oregon, and two more in Utah, where he was now living. At the same time, he was studying law at Utah University. Probably could have easily become a lawyer if he hadn't been consumed with murder 24 hours a day. The thing is, with serial killers, they are addicted to murder. It's like any other addiction. People may try it first for a high, but you need more and more of the substance, and the substance is murder. But Bundy was about to make his first mistake. On November 8th, posing as an off-duty policeman, he tried to abduct 19-year-old Carol Durange from a shopping center. He told her someone had broken into her car and offered to help. But inside his car, he tried to handcuff her. Carol fought back, and with the handcuffs still on her wrists, was able to jump out of the car and escape. Here we have a living victim that's able to describe her abductor, describe the car, and also provide evidence with the handcuff that was still on her wrist. But the police still had no idea who her attacker could be, and Bundy was a master of disguise. He just looked different all the time. One time he'd have a beard, one time he'd have long stringy hair, one time he'd have a short haircut. And I think it varied with, you know, what he was doing at the time. As 1975 began, Bundy widened his neck to include Utah, Idaho, and Colorado. He killed eight women between January and August, but there was no way to connect the murders. Since July of 1974, the Washington police had whittled down their number of suspects named Ted to 200. Bundy remained on their roster, but still, no one suspected the law student at Utah University. The disappearances come closer together, the murders come closer together, the, the orchestration is more finely tuned. But Bundy's luck was about to change. Early on the morning of August 15th, Bundy's car was stopped by a police officer in Utah. Because he had been driving erratically, his car was searched. In the midst of that investigation, the trooper found this bag. And in the bag was a crowbar, handcuffs, ski mask. So he carried his own chamber of horrors around with him. Bundy was immediately arrested on suspicion of burglary. They also found gas receipts and maps that later linked Bundy to the sites of the abductions in Colorado. And more importantly, in a police lineup, Carol Durant identified Bundy as the man who had attacked her. We were shocked. We couldn't believe it. Uh, we tried to raise money for a defense fund for him and, and tried to protect him. We couldn't believe it. They had to have the wrong guy. On February 23rd, 1976, Bundy went on trial for her attempted kidnapping. As the trial began, Bundy sat in the courtroom, totally convinced that he would be found innocent. But on the stand, Carol Durange told of her ordeal at his hands and pointed Bundy out as her assailant. He was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. While he was incarcerated, investigators linked him to the murder of Karen Campbell in Colorado. But nothing fazed Ted Bundy, even being featured as the lead story on the evening news. Have you ever physically harmed anyone? Ever physically harmed anyone? No. No. You know, uh, again, not in the context, I think, that you, you're speaking of. Ted was, was very self-assured uh, to the point of cockiness. Uh, even, even when the murder charges had been filed. In April of 1977, he was transferred to Colorado to await trial. There, Bundy fired his lawyers and was granted permission to defend himself in the upcoming case. Bundy had supreme confidence in his uh, intellect, uh, in his ability to beat the system, to work the system even if it meant avoiding trial completely. Two months later, after casing out the court's law library, 
he jumped out of a two-story window and escaped. Though captured six days later, he wouldn't stay locked up for long. I've matured in the past year. Believe me, I've grown in the past year, and I've learned a lot of things about myself in the past year. My only misgivings is that I might never be, might never be in a position to apply it, you know, on the streets where I'd like to apply it. But soon he would apply it. On New Year's Eve 1977, Ted Bundy shimmied through an air duct of the Colorado jail and walked to freedom. He went through the top of his cell, down through the jailer's apartment, out into a blizzard. Free once again, Ted Bundy would continue to kill. Ted Bundy had succeeded in a spectacular prison escape and had made his way to Florida. He was now on the FBI's most wanted list, something he must have relished. Loved it, loved it. I always said that infamy became Ted. He changed his name, grew a beard, and spent his time walking the Florida State University campus in Tallahassee. I think it was about January 8th when he rolled into town, determined, as he said in his confession, uh, never to so much as jaywalk. But he wouldn't keep that resolution. Sometime after midnight on January 15th, 1978, just two weeks after his escape, Bundy entered the back door of the university's Chi Omega sorority house. As his victims slept, Ted Bundy crept from room to room. He bludgeoned, raped, and killed Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman. He assaulted and almost killed roommates Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner. I think he went in that house to kill every single woman in it. But Bundy wasn't finished. Less than a mile away, he broke into the apartment of Cheryl Thomas. Though he savagely beat her and left her to die, she survived. She was the fifth woman Bundy had attacked that night. It's not something that's causing him guilt because he's free of that. He feels justified and entitled. After what women did to him, why shouldn't he do this to women? Three weeks later, he would kill again. His victim was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, an attractive and popular junior high school student. Kimberly was kidnapped, brutally assaulted, and killed. But Bundy's reign of terror was about to end. On February 15, 1978, a patrolman pulled over a VW bug that had been reported stolen. Ted tried to flee on one foot. There was a struggle. There was actually a round fired. Uh, and the, the officer was able to bring Ted into custody. Bundy was arrested and identified. Over the following months, investigators in Florida gathered evidence that tied Bundy to Kimberly Leach's murder and the murders and assaults at the sorority house. Though other states sought to extradite Bundy, his first trial would begin in Florida on July 7, 1979. You're going to represent yourself, or you're going to get another attorney? I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. Bundy acted as his own defense attorney in the Chi Omega murders. He took depositions of witnesses. He filed his own motions, and I responded to those strictly on a professional basis. But at one point, as he questioned an officer about one of the murder scenes, the jurors had a terrifying view of the real Ted Bundy. He walked toward the jury, and you could see them kind of lean back in their chairs as he approached them. And he asked a few perfunctory questions of the officer, and then asked him to please state with great detail what you saw when you pulled back those sheets. And there was no human being in that building or watching the TV at that time that could have thought anything other than this man wanted to relive that event. Two weeks later, Bundy was found guilty and sentenced to death for the murders of Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman. In January 1980, Bundy went on trial for the murder of Kimberly Leach. Again, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. 
but his execution would not take place for some time. Over the next nine years, Bundy would appeal his convictions and cheat death by a series of last-minute stays, sometimes only minutes before his sentence was to be carried out. Finally, after countless appeals, Bundy's date of execution was scheduled for January of 1989. To postpone his death, he told authorities that he would provide information on other unsolved cases linked to him. He gives them just enough information to get their interest, to show them that he does, in fact, know what he's talking about. And then Bundy systematically tells these investigators, you need to get with your authorities and have them contact the Florida authorities because I need more time to tell you this. This is all I can tell you today. And I need more time. If you can just uh, get the, the, the Florida authorities to agree to more time, I can provide you with all of the details. It was a desperate ploy. Uh, it was a last ditch effort, but even there, I think Bundy, up until the morning of his execution, Bundy really thought that uh, he could postpone the inevitable. But he couldn't. On January 24th, 1989, at the age of 41, Ted Bundy, the articulate, handsome boy next door, a man who had the capability of being virtually anything he wanted, but who instead chose to become a monster obsessed with murder, was executed in the electric chair. The real question isn't how to remember Ted Bundy. The question is how to remember all those girls. You know, right at the prime of their lives. You know, these all these kids were 19, 20 years old. They had the world by the tail. They had the future. And uh, how many families were left in this total tragedy and disarray? And unfortunately, uh, we remember Ted Bundy, and, and I'd much rather remember those girls. Saturday at 8, a and &E is issuing you a search warrant. Search for justice on American justice. We know we have our man. Search for evidence on cold case files. DNA is like the finger of God pointing down. Search for truth on City Confidential. I'm selling sex like other people are selling soda pop. You'll find them all beginning at 8 tonight on A&E.